Welcome to The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's bi-weekly webcast on fiscal policy for the COVID-19 economy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host, Howard Gleckman, a senior fellow at TPC and editor of our blog, TaxVox. Our guest today is Mark Mazur. Mark is the Robert C. Posen Director of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. And Mark and I will be talking about tax policy in a Joe Biden presidency. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. We encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Please identify yourself and your organization as if you were asking the question in person. The event's being recorded and will be posted online at TPC's website in the near future. If you'd like to join the conversation on social media, please use the hashtag live at urban. And if you'd like to suggest a future guest for the prescription, just email us at info at taxpolicycenter.org. Mark Mazur, welcome to The Prescription. Good to be here, Howard. Good to be with you. So to get started, I wonder if you could just take a couple of minutes to walk us through some of the key elements of President-elect Biden's tax plan. Sure. Um, I think the uh, tax plan that's laid out by the Biden campaign really is their long-term vision for what they'd like the uh, tax code to look like. And so that involves increasing taxes on corporations, um, particularly those corporations that have relatively low tax burdens now. Um, and it involves increasing taxes on high income individuals, um, either income taxes or payroll taxes, um, estate taxes, and, and uh, some other provisions that would um, raise revenue from, from, from the folks at the top of the income distribution. And it has a number of targeted tax benefits, whether they be tax credits aimed at first time home buyers or renters, um, increased child tax credits. Um, and those generally would help out um, taxpayers in the lower and middle part of the income distribution. So it's to summarize, it raises a fair amount of revenue that would be used to finance other government programs. And it shifts the tax burden in a way that makes the U.S. tax system more progressive. But that really is a long-term vision. Um, uh, and they, they probably don't expect to have everything enacted in the, in the near future. Probably a good thing, given the politics. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, so uh, Tax Policy Center, as it always does, did a, a, a revenue analysis, a distribution analysis, and a macro analysis of the Biden plan. So why don't you give us a sense of what we found? So the um, revenue analysis done by the Tax Policy Center found that the uh, Biden tax plan taken as a whole would raise about um, $2.1 trillion over the traditional 10-year budget window and substantially more in the, the second 10 years and longer run. Um, and, and that uh, is a netting of the tax increases that, that uh, I discussed on corporations and, and high-income individuals and the tax uh, benefits that, that uh, largely flow to lower and middle income households. Um, the uh, macro analysis of the um, plan showed that there would be a initial boost to the economy as a result of a refundable child tax credit in first year, but then a little bit of a drag on the economy as the tax increases um, began to, to uh, flow through the economy but it really was a modest uh, uh, reduction in the amount of revenue that would be, would be raised. And in the longer run, as the uh, federal fiscal house gets put into a little bit better order, um, there would be a crowding in of, of investment. So in the, in the much longer run, kind of a, a bump up in, in economic activity. On the distributional side, um, basically the tax, uh, Provisions are born, the individual uh, income tax provisions and the estate tax provisions are born almost totally by very high income households. The corporate income tax provisions get spread throughout the income distribution as Tax Policy Center um, has determined that the long run incidence of the corporate tax is felt primarily by shareholders, but a little bit by labor. And so there would be tax um, uh, increases from the corporate part of the um, plan, but overall it would look like tax cuts for lower income people, tax increases for higher income people. Yeah, it's interesting. As I think about this, I, I, I sort of, I like to divide it up into these two pieces. So really rough numbers. Uh, 
he would cut taxes for low and moderate income households by about a trillion dollars. And he'd raise taxes for corporations and high income households by about $3 trillion. So you get yep. a net of about $2 trillion. So let's unpack that a little bit. Let's, let's think about the individual uh, tax provisions first. So as you noted, uh, he's proposed a long list of highly targeted tax cuts for renters, for first time home buyers, for family caregivers of older adults, uh, and especially for families with kids. Do you think that's the best way to deliver a support to lower and moderate income families? Um, well, one of the, there are a couple of different theories on this. One is that providing tax benefits or lower tax uh, uh, payments or, or even tax, increased tax refunds to low income households is a way to boost the economy. And so things like a temporary increase in the uh, tax credit for uh, families with children does that. Um, in, in the longer run, what you try to do is look at uh, provisions that have larger social benefits and try to drive uh, tax policy in, in, that, in that direction. And so something like a first time home buyer credit may have uh, larger economic benefits in that it may help um, improve uh, home ownership, improve uh, social well being in, in communities improve wealth building uh, opportunities for a range of, uh, of households in a way that would benefit society as a whole. So you could see uh, some, some of that going on there. Um, in the case of things like uh, tax credits for caregivers, it really is a recognition that um, what, a, what a caregiver does is generally provide unpaid for labor. And this is a way to, to address that. Um, so each of these, I think, has a separate justification for it. The interesting thing about the first time home buyer credit is they think about it as a maybe a, a, a foot in the door to, to beginning to make a, a transition from a deduction to a credit, uh, maybe just not for first time home buyers, or maybe for everybody at some point. Yes, I think uh, Gene Sterling has written on, on this as a way to take what looks like a fairly inefficient subsidy for home ownership, the home mortgage interest deduction, and turn it into something that actually would be more efficient and more targeted. So at the other end of the economic food chain, Biden's proposed several changes in the way we tax high income households. But unlike some Democrats, he wouldn't create a wealth tax. Uh, instead, he'd raise taxes on investment income like capital gains and dividends. He'd tax unrealized capital gains and death and he'd raise the estate tax. So this seems to be an interesting fight that, that was, we saw played out, of course, during the campaign where uh, uh, a couple of candidates uh, uh, proposed a wealth tax. Biden specifically didn't. So give, give me a sense of the trade-offs here between a wealth tax on one hand or the, 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 the version that, that Biden is looking at. So I think one of the big trade-offs is just um, the ability to implement a wealth tax at all and administer it well. And that there are constitutional issues that need to be resolved, whether the federal government can have a wealth tax at all. And then there are tax administration issues. How do you go about implementing a tax like this. In particular, how do you go about valuing wealth that's not held in publicly traded securities, which is a longstanding problem in, in the tax code and one that would be exacerbated if there was an annual wealth tax where taxpayers in the IRS would essentially fight over the value of a car dealership or the value of uh, real property or, or the value of paintings that people have in their house, whether it's a, a, a true mo, you know, Monet or, or a copy um, is, is important in figuring out what the, the valuation is. In, in contrast, the Biden plans tend to build on provisions that are already in the tax code. Um, to increase taxes on qualified dividends and long-term capital gains, we have long-standing rules. How do you measure that? And so you could uh, build on, on, on that. Um, increasing payroll taxes on people with income more than $400,000. We know how to do that. We know how to administer that. So I think the trade-off really is kind of a, a aspirational goal to have a brand new tax source or um, going with uh, tools that are already in place and could be, could be modified. Okay, so on the corporate side, Biden's got several big proposals. Um, one of them would be a tax on book income a uh, very interesting idea. Uh, he'd uh, raise the corporate income tax rate 
from 21% to 28%. And then he's got some ideas for using the tax code to encourage US firms to produce in the US. One's a carrot, a 15% tax credit for domestic inve investment. And then he's got this 21% country by country minimum tax on income earned by foreign subsidiaries in the US. So uh, let's talk about the book tax proposal first. Is, is, is that actually implementable? Can, can, can that actually work? No, um, the US had a corporate alternative minimum tax that had a book tax adjustment after the 1986 Tax Reform Act. So it can be done. Um, it also was dropped um, because it did not work as well as anticipated and caused a lot of, of, of uh, knock-on effects that were, were kind of difficult to, uh, to deal with. Um, so yes, it can be done. It's hard and there are a lot of issues that need to be worked through. Um, one of the, the potential problems that you hear this from the accounting firms is that uh, the, the firm's auditors really don't want to be put in position of being the, the kind of tax collector, um, essentially figuring out how much tax that the company will, will be paying. What they, they view their job as, and, and I think this is correct, is to provide investors with a true look at what the profitability of the firm is. Um, so let's look at this, this, these two ideas for encouraging domestic investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, this is something that, that has a lot of support. Uh, President Trump talked about doing something like this as well, and lots of people in Congress like it. So you, you, you have a, a, a special tax credit for firms that, that produce in the United States, and then you have this uh, country by country minimum tax that would sort of replace the guilty that was in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So I guess the bottom line question is, do you think that the combination of the carrot and the stick would actually have the effects that Biden hopes and would materially increase domestic investment or would firms just figure out some way to get around this? Well, I guess first, you don't want to underestimate the um, in ingenuity of firms and their advisors. And so um, you really should should uh, take uh, take all these these statements about the effectiveness with a, with a big grain of salt. Um, a tax credit to encourage investment in the United States, that's something we've had before. We've had investment tax credits. We sort of know how they work. Um, do they increase investment in the US? Yeah, a little bit, um, but it's not something that I think would cause firms to undo their global supply chains just to get a small tax benefit. Um, I think really what, what we're seeing in, in the uh, global economy is that firms make decisions on where to locate physical assets based on where it makes business sense and tax is the second order effect. In contrast, the 21% minimum tax really is a tax on where firms say they locate their intellectual property. Um, and firms have a, a great degree of latitude on where they do that. Um, I think Marty Sullivan has written about the luck of the Irish with all the uh, activity going on in Ireland and we've seen data showing that lots of, uh, of uh, intellectual property appears to be located in the Cayman Islands. Not that there's a lot of intellectual property development going on there, but somehow the property gets located there. Um, and so the 21% minimum tax is, is intended to address those decisions um, and to say no matter where a firm decides to locate their intellectual property, whether it's patents or trademarks or brand names or, or other types of intellectual property that um, when it's used in the United States to generate profits, uh, or when it's used around the world to generate profits by a US-based firm, there's a chunk of that uh, profit which goes to the US, to US government because you really can't tell where the property um, should be geographically located because it's intangible. It doesn't have a tangible thing that you can look at and say where it's located. So one, one of the arguments against a minimum tax that suggests a minimum tax is never going to be really fully effective is that if you just have some countries imposing a minimum tax and other countries not, you, you, you're really not going to be able to get at this problem. Is, is, so is, is it productive? Does the U.S. sort of lead the way here or um, uh, is, this, is this sort of a, a lost cause? Well, this is a situation that the uh, OECD countries have all been wrestling with. Um, if you're a European com com country and you look around and you see that all your citizens are searching on Google or consuming coffee in Starbucks, and then you look at the revenue tables and you see almost no revenue coming in from Google or Starbucks, you're not happy with that situation. And so as a country, you look, look at that and say, well, is there a better way? And it could be the case that if the 
um, industrialized countries, the uh, you know the larger market economies, get together and agree on a system where there are these um, minimum taxes in place. That that's a better situation than the current race to the bottom, where countries try to keep lowering their rates. So that suggests that the U.S. really couldn't do it alone, but maybe we could set a course for the rest of the world. Well, and you sort of saw, saw that in the discussions at the OECD, where the guilty tax was essentially characterized as a minimum tax and one that that would be uh, at least attractive to a lot of a lot of countries. So let, let's talk a little bit about the, the politics mm -hmm. of, of all this. So as we've been discussing, Biden has a very ambitious tax agenda, but he's got a problem. Uh, pending the outcome of these two runoff elections in, in Georgia in January, Republicans continue to control the Senate. So conventional wisdom is that Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell will just block everything uh, and make sure that Biden gets nothing done. Uh, I did a blog the other day in which I said, well, maybe there's actually some things that Biden could accomplish, uh, at least on the margins. Uh, what, what, what's your take on that? Is, are there some areas where you think Biden could, uh, could, could succeed in some of his tax proposals, even with a Republican Senate? So I guess I look at the Biden campaign tax proposals as their long run goal, where they would like to go and kind of taking steps in that direction, regardless of what those, those steps are, that steps that are consistent with that long run goal are things that they should do. And you're right to point out that with the Republican dominated Senate, um, pretty much the things that are more likely to get enacted are things that have broad bipartisan support and things that are least likely to be enacted are things that are uh, supported only by one of the, the two major parties. Um, that would be something that could maybe pass the, the House, but kind of die in the Senate. We've sort of seen that happen with a bunch of legislation. Or kind of flip the other way, something that uh, Leader McConnell could get passed through a Republican Senate, but have almost no chance in the, in the House or being signed into law. And so really it does point out the goal, the, the, the benefits of setting a goal, trying to find areas of bipartisan agreement. And in your blog, you talked about things like a child tax credit, which um, um, Senator Rubio, Senator Lee have been supportive of, um, along with a number of, of, of Democrats. And so there are things where you can find um, overlap and, and, and see uh, opportunities to move forward. I think one of the, the big wild cards is if the Republicans in the Senate are going to rediscover their concern for the federal budget deficit. Um, in which case, then coming up with pay fors would be something that um, would be on the uh, on the table. And and the interesting question, of course, is where do those pay fors come from? Biden, of course, got a long list of them. Yep. But do, do you see that any of them would be acceptable uh, as part of a broader deal to uh, Senate Republicans? So I've not studied the the Biden ones with that lens, but I I do to note that a number of things that were in the last Obama budget wound up in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, and so if you're looking for kind of small board pay fors, um, that's one of the things that people typically do. They'll look at an administration's budget and see what um, is kind of meets the acceptability threshold and then kind of go from there. So yeah, I could see some of that, uh, some, some of that uh, uh, adoption. Could you imagine, uh, just to take one sort of big idea, mm -hmm. Could you imagine the, the White House and the House passing a bill that significantly cuts taxes for low and middle income people that's paid for by a corporate income tax rate increase, maybe not to 28%, but maybe to 23 or 24%? Oh, sure. You can see, you can see a lot of variations on that theme where it would be a, an attractive tax cut that pretty much everybody would want to support. And then a pay for that kind of meets the threshold of acceptability. And, and, and a threshold I think would be something that's not so obvious a tax increase. Um, and so raising the top individual tax rate probably off the table, but corporate tax, um, that's an indirect uh, tax on, on individuals that might be on the table. Um, it almost brings to mind some of the, the things we had seen in the past with the PEAS provision, which really didn't have a tax obvious tax rate increase, but did raise taxes on high income folks. And that could be more broadly acceptable. Mm -hmm. so, so you think that, that in, the, in the right 
environment that Senate Republicans might be willing to uh, accept some of uh, Biden's proposals and might be willing to pay for them? I think that's the, the, the first part might be willing to accept their proposal, obviously on the tax cut side. It, mm -hmm. Evidence seems that that's uh, possible. On the need for a pay for, that would come down to whether the Senate Republicans think that they, they need a pay for in order to, to do this. I mean, obviously the incoming administration and the, the House looking at an economy that's in the doldrums would probably prefer an unpaid for tax cut as a way to provide stimulus. Um, yeah, I, there was a lot of chatter on, on Twitter actually this morning about this, about whether or not they could just do this stuff in a, in a stimulus bill, uh, cut, you know, do a, a child tax credit increase, keep the Democrats happy, do some, some provisions to help out corporate on perhaps cost recovery, make the Republicans happy, call it stimulus and not pay for any of it. And we saw that in 2015 when uh, Congress agreed to extend a bunch of tax uh, expiring provisions permanently um, in an unpaid for way. And we saw in 2017 with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, so no, it's, it's certainly not out of the realm of, of possibility. I think one of the, the wild cards is what's gonna happen in the lame duck session in that um, Congress has to pass a bill to keep the federal government open. Um, there are a number of expiring provisions that uh, will probably get some attention. And then the, the open question is, does some kind of stimulus or recovery provisions, do they tag along with that? And in which case, you know, getting something done in late November, or December may reduce the need to get stuff done in January, February. Yeah, I, I, I have to laugh about this, you know, the, sort of inside Washington baseball, but, you know, I keep telling people watch out for the, uh, the expiring provision that reduces excise taxes on beer, wine and uh, distilled spirits, because it's a proposal that everybody in the, on the Hill wants to save. Um, and it, it would be funny if a stimulus bill or some of these other provisions ride along a, uh, an extender bill uh, that keeps the, 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 the liquor industry happy. No, exactly. I think you've seen in the Senate, uh, Mr. Wyden, strong proponent of this, uh, Leader McConnell, probably fine with the bourbon tax uh, not, not increasing. Um, and in the, in the House, you know, representatives like uh, Mike Thompson on the, the, the wine side and the entire, uh, there must be a House Beer Caucus, the entire caucus. <laughs> of it. Uh, yeah. And we had uh, Senator Portman on a couple of weeks ago, and he called it out too, is, is, yeah. is an issue he's interested in. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's funny, but it could end up, something like that could end up being the vehicle. And that could be like oh. the locomotive for a train. Yeah, that's right. What was it, what was it the, the, um, the, 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 tax, the Tax Reform Act of, of 1986 rode along on a, on a tiny little tariff bill, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so you, you, you never know. Um, so I, I wanna go back for, we got an interesting question from one of our listeners. Um, and it goes back to the individual provisions. Uh, uh, President-elect Biden has focused principally on a child tax credit. Uh, Vice President-elect uh, Harris talked about a big extension of the earned income credit. Uh, talk for a second about the pros and cons of, uh, to some degree you're helping the same people, but the, the pros and cons of a child credit versus an earned income credit. Sure, so the earned income credit is uh, viewed as a income supplement for working families, in a sense, almost like a, a wage supplement, um, and kind of checks a, a, a bit of a box about um, ensuring that um, people who work full-time actually have resources to run a household. And it's much larger for families with children, so it, it really does, uh, do, do, does that. Um, the child tax credit, in contrast, is um, basically just based on having children under the age of 17 um, and partially refundable, not completely refundable, whereas the earned income credit is completely refundable. So there are, there are trade-offs. Uh, I think the, the, the larger one, though, is just on the uh, uh, labor force uh, participation side, where the earned income credit has some effect and, and the child credit um, much, much less, if any, if any effect. So it sounds like if, if you had a choice, you, 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 you're an earned income credit guy. I would think, I would think that's a, a, a better way to go. Um, and I think the area where the earned income credit probably needs the, the most expansion are workers without children. That uh, current credit is quite modest on the order of $550 a year maximum. Um, and really that's um, a reflection of 
the history of, uh, of the, the earned income credit, which was expanded over time, but uh, larger expansions were, for, were uh, intended for families with children. Um, and the, the child tax credit is kind of under, taken away at least some of that uh, need for, 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 for those expansions. And I always remember that the earned income credit is actually based on an idea that came from Milton Friedman long ago. So it's long a, it's a Republican idea. Bipartisan history and enacted in the, the Nixon uh, administration, right? Yeah, I, I think maybe in the Ford administration, but yeah, but, but certainly yeah. back in back in those days, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so in, uh, if Biden is sort of trapped by the politics of a Republican Senate and can't get much of what he wants, or well, we discussed he gets some of it done, how much could he do on the regulatory side? Is, is, is there much opportunity for Treasury to write regulations that would that would make some of the changes at least that Biden wants, or is, does that have to happen through legislation? So there, there are some things that can be done uh, administratively or on the regulatory side, but you know things like changing tax rates, that's not doable. I think the, the, the limits on, on regulations are that you can interpret tax laws and tax laws are pretty detailed and so the scope for interpretation is relatively small. Um, there is some, and in the, the Obama administration, you saw um, regulatory um, information come out that looked at things like corporate inversions or trying to draw a line between debt and equity. And so there are things you can do, um, but you really, it, it really is much harder to target tax benefits to uh, particular activities or particular populations uh, on, on the regulatory side. Obviously, when a new administration comes in, they look at all the regulatory actions that the previous administration had taken and prioritize which ones they want to address, either build upon or, or reverse. And uh, an incoming Biden administration almost for sure would talk to the career staff at IRS and, and Treasury uh, Office of Tax Policy and go through those regulatory actions and kind of say, okay, which of these um, basically which of these did you want to do for good policy reasons and couldn't and, and put those toward the top of the list of, of, of undoing. Is there, is there one that you have in mind that you think uh, the, the, the a Biden treasury would target, either one that was done during the, the, uh, the Trump years or one that wasn't done? I would think they would, they would look at a lot of the regulations that accompanied the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act because those regulations really interpreted the legislation um, at times in ways that seem um, inconsistent with the, the stated language of, of the law, or at least the understanding of um, the, the tax rate committees. And so really taking a look at, at those issues would probably be a, a first place to, to start. So we've got just a couple of minutes left and I wanna ask you about uh, the economy. Uh, mm -hmm. Jobs numbers came out this morning and they were still terrible, but less terrible than they had been. Uh, what does that tell you about the likelihood of a stimulus bill in a lame duck? We talked a little bit about before, or is this something that's going to have to be put off until next year? Um, that's that's the big question, and it really comes down to negotiations between uh, Speaker Pelosi, Leader McConnell, and and the Trump administration. The uh, Speaker has been very clear that she thinks that. There's a lot of unemployment, a lot of hurt you know, throughout the, the U.S. economy. It needs to be addressed with additional stimulus. Um, Leader McConnell has been um, acknowledging some of the, the hurt and the unemployment, but not to the same extent. Um, and the, the Trump administration in October was, was calling for a large um, stimulus bill, but has been relatively silent um, since. And so kind of getting those, those three parties together and trying to figure out what needs to be done is important. Um, I think uh, just, just two observations. One that um, the fact that we have large lines at food banks around the country indicates that there's a ton of hurt in the, in the economy. And that's something that, that really as a society, we should, we should take steps to address. And then second, um, this, you know, we have 10 million or, or more people who had jobs um, in February, we don't have jobs now. Um, that's also an indication that there's some big, some big problems. Uh, I, I really think when, when the, the Biden administration uh, comes in, kind of first step is gonna be getting the COVID-19 pandemic under uh, control. And second step is gonna be dealing with the economy that seems to be in the, in, in the doldrums. And stuff that is done now that may help with stimulus or recovery may make the uh, job a little bit easier in the, in subsequent months. 
Well, we're out of time. Uh, Mark Mazur, thank you very much for joining us at the Tax Policy Center. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to, the, uh, to the audience. Uh, and we'll see you, again. see you again soon. Thank you.